Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to greet you this morning. We have a few announcements to share. We will have an informational session about the proposed merger with uh, West Chicago to be held Wednesday, September 21st, seven o'clock here at the church. Let us take a few moments and center ourselves for worship. One more announcement that I almost Overlooked, we got a letter from UMCOR thanking us for our donations to their ministries. Between the Tree of Life Ministry and UMCOR Sager Brown, we have given a total of almost $650. So that will go a long way in their relief efforts around the world. So thank you for that. I invite you to stand as you're able and we'll join together in the call to worship. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not forsake me. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and let your ordinances help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek out your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Now let us join together in hymn number 62, All Creatures of Our God and King, verses 1, 4, and 5.
Now let us join together in the prayer of confession. Lord, we pride ourselves on being children of grace instead of slaves to the law. But often our lives do not reflect the wholeness to which you have saved us. Forgive us when we think only of your grace and ignore our discipleship. Help us to choose to live in such a way that our lifestyles will be in harmony with your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hear the good news, through Christ we are reconciled with our gracious God. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And thanks be to God, amen. Please be seated and let us join together in hymn number 405, Seek Ye First. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 through 48. Please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment, and if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. 
Twas also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn also the other. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to the one who asks of you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May we be blessed by our hearing and understanding of the word this morning. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are finally into the New Testament and through with those pesky prophets who remind us that we are not so much different than those ancient Israelites who took God's blessings for granted and worshiped idols. But now we come to Jesus who says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a pretty tough road to hoe because the scribes spent their lives studying the scriptures and the Pharisees tried to keep the law down to the most minute detail. So what chance do we have? Well, Jesus is not calling his followers to perfection, but to a greater goodness than trying to meet the letter of the law. Jesus wants us to follow the spirit of the law, to make it a law of love rather than one of doctrine. Jesus goes on to point out how Righteousness shows itself in right relationships and gives us examples. Regarding anger, you have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you 
that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, and remember that a sister or brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and first be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Murder comes from anger taken to the extreme, but lesser anger can also hurt relationships, especially the hair trigger anger that seems to come out of nowhere without any warning. Notice also that Jesus says, not only if you are angry with somebody, are you liable to judgment, but also if someone has something against you, then you need to be reconciled also. Just as anger disturbs relationships, forgiveness renews it. It's easier to say that I have nothing against anyone, though seemingly not so easy these days, but it is much more difficult to not anger somebody else, even seemingly without much provocation. People seem quick to take offense these days, and it's not just an individual problem, but a problem that can affect group fellowship as well. How many times have we come to the altar or taken communion knowing that someone is angry with us? Jesus said that we need to realize that when we have hurt someone and then go seek and try to reconcile with them before coming into God's presence with our gifts. It's not always easy to do, but it is something that we are called to do relationally. Jesus says similar things about adultery, divorce, oaths, and retaliation. So it's not enough just to not commit adultery, but Jesus calls upon us not to even think about it, because once again, impure thoughts can lead to actions. It's comparatively easy not to commit adultery, but it's another not to even look at an attractive person with just a little bit of desire. Jesus calls us to go beyond right actions to righteous thinking. And oaths today are much different than they were in Jesus' time. It used to be that someone would demonstrate their truth or earnestness by stating, by God or before heaven, I swear that this or that is true or that I will do something. Nowadays, it seems more likely to be a threat, as in, by God, I'm going to do such and such to you if you don't. And today, people seem to cuss a lot, seeking to profane someone or to bring them down by saying such things as, you are so full of blank, we don't seem to have nearly the reverence for either God, people, or things that earlier generations had. Maybe it's because it's harder for people to consider things greater than themselves today. And the self is now the basis for worth or comparison. I think our lives have been diminished because of it. And we seem to lack the humility that puts us into right relationship with God, creation, and one another. 
we don't seem to place the same value on these relationships that we once did. Perhaps because of the disposability of things in our consumer economy. We use things up and throw them away or maybe don't use things all the way up before throwing away rather than seeking to make them last. We rarely repair anything anymore. Things are, are built to be disposable. This is why we have such a problem finding places to put our throwaway items. And recycling isn't really as much a thing as they make it out to be. I recently read where only about 10% of the plastics are actually recycled. And that's the plastics we managed to get into the recycling stream. I think it's essentially a fabrication to make us feel better about what happens to things we consume and then throw away. Maybe it's because the earth is not felt to be worthy of our concern or our stewardship. So future generations will have to pay the price for our selfish pollution. Jesus also tells us not to retaliate, but to leave retribution to God. But our society seems to be all about retribution. We are often thinking about getting back at someone, evening the score and not in a good way. We want some payback. But Jesus says to embarrass people by going overboard to accommodate those who oppose you. He uses the example of someone in court taking your shirt and then giving them your coat as well. In those times, that would make you naked. And then that the naked person would follow the person around who had his clothing because being naked back then wasn't as much of an embarrassment as it is now. But being known to have made someone naked would be a tremendous embarrassment. And likewise with going the second mile, Roman soldiers were able to conscript civilians into carrying their things for them for up to a mile to give themselves some respite from their load. But making them go any farther than a mile would get them in trouble. So a soldier wouldn't want to be seen with someone carrying their things for more than a mile for fear of what the consequences might be. So can you imagine the scene of a soldier begging someone to give him back their items and to stop carrying them? Each one of these cases would reverse the power dynamic, putting the victim in the position of power, having the power to humiliate the oppressor. And finally, Jesus tells us, Give to the one who asks of you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Jesus lived in a world of subsistence rather than in the world of plenty that we have. So it would have been essential to provide for people in order for them to simply live at times. We are much less likely today to take a meal down the street to the poor Jones family than our grandparents would have. To them, they would have seen it as a Christian duty, whereas today we might worry about embarrassing them or just not think much about it at all other than, wow, that's too bad for them. Today, with our comparative wealth and self-centeredness, we tend to think that people get what they deserve. So 
Poor people must be lazy and unworthy of help because they're to blame for their own situation. And when we do help, it is often considered to be more of an inconvenient inconvenience than a duty to help our brothers and sisters, something that we might actually feel good about doing. And then lastly, God uses godly perfection as the standard for which we should all hold ourselves. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. If the standard is to behave like God does in loving and providing for others, well, then we've got a long way to go to even get close to the same zip code. It's difficult to love others that we don't really like let alone our enemies, whereas it's much, much easier to love our friends and families. But Jesus tells us to love everyone, even our enemies, for they are also children of God, just the same as we are. Just because we are not able to see it or appreciate it doesn't make it any less so. As Paul tells us in Romans 12, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals upon their heads. Again, you would be embarrassing your enemies with goodness because they will suffer by comparison. And in Jesus' time, a good name and good appearance were much more important than they seem to be today. Killing with kindness is not really a thing anymore, whereas killing, injuring, or demeaning are more and more common and take us further and further away from being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I think we all know that perfection is unattainable. And so often seeking perfection is the enemy of the good because we can never be good enough when we are seeking the illusion of perfection. But in our relationships with one another, we need to go to the extreme of trying to be as good as we can with each other. So let us seek to provide for each other, to lift each other up instead of tearing each other down, for that is what God does, seeking to lift us closer to heaven rather than pushing us down lower into the dirt because there is too much hell in the world today in the form of hunger and violence and not enough heaven through love and concern for others. We generally see more judgment of the less fortunate than righteousness in seeking to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters. So may we seek to love as God loves us, providing the best we can from what we have, for that is what God in Christ calls us to do, to use our blessings to bless others. It's the overarching theme of the whole Bible, blessing others. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.
Let us join together in the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we come into our time of prayer together. Does anyone have joys or concerns that they would lift up this morning? Okay, prayers for the Oligas cousin who has suffered from a hemorrhagic stroke in the Philippines. Okay, let us keep Amy in our prayers as she's struggling with uh, cancer. Lift up the joys of the birthdays this last week. Vicki and Olive and Janet Ong, who is 90 today. Sorry? And, and Abanaya, happy birthday. This, um, remember those who still suffer from the effects of the attacks of 9-11, was it 21 years ago? And um, let's keep the Christian family in our prayers after the death of Pastor Avani's father-in-law. Let us pray for those who are living under drought or flooding conditions around the world that seem to be becoming more and more prevalent. And those, especially in California, that are suffering from the, the wildfires that are going on now. Let's keep the Ray family in our prayers as Sue and Ed are both in decline and now are dealing with financial hardship because of Sue being in 24-hour um, nursing care. Let us take the joys and concerns that we have named and those that yet remain upon our heart to the one whose grace and strength are sufficient. Let us pray. Lord, you know that we live in a world filled with suffering and violence, full of anger and hatred and oppression. Help us to follow the example that you have given us in Jesus to reach out with love and compassion for those around us and help our brothers and sisters to meet their daily needs. Lord, give us the strength of compassion to be willing to reach out where we see needs and to think of others before thinking of ourselves. Lord, we pray for those who live under conditions of oppression and violence, for those who have lost their living space for what other, whatever reason, for those who have lost most of their possessions, their clothing, their dwellings, and those who do not know where they will sleep tonight or find their next meal. We pray that your church and its relief agencies such as UMCOR will be up to the challenge of reaching out to providing for your children around the world in their need and help us to reach out to our neighbors close to home. Lord, we give you thanks for your words of scripture and the example of Jesus that we find there that 
show us how you would have us live out our lives to live into your coming kingdom. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come into our time of offering together. This month and next, we will be collecting for the Blue Band, which is Bridge Communities, who reach out to provide free transitional housing to over 130 homeless DuPage County families each year. During the two years the families spend in their program, they are able to save money, earn budgeting skills, and obtain better employment so they can live self-sufficiently once they graduate. If you would care to donate to Bridge Communities, please make note of that with your offering. Let us dedicate our gifts. Lord, you call on us to help others as you have helped us. Accept these gifts from our hands to uplift those in need so that your name might be glorified. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you're able and to prepare to join in our closing hymn, number 529, I'll firm a foundation, verses one through, five, one through three and five. to be, to live into God's righteousness. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. Amen.